All right, we've been teaching on, and we'll continue. If you've got prayer class, go ahead and bring them up. Um, praise the Lord. You just go ahead and set them right here behind me on the platform. Glory to God. We're teaching on the, we've been teaching uh, on the doctrine of the divine. We got, got interrupted with Ken Kasich and so forth. That's okay. Um, but uh, we're, we're teaching on the doctrine of divine healing. God, you know, and, and we've covered some things. We're going to talk about all, uh, uh, the phys- physiologically, that all sickness is the result of sin, ultimately. Okay? Um, hospitals, asylums, sanitariums, other institutions throughout our land are tangible evidence to the presence of sin and its manifestation in the human body. This does not mean, however, that every time a person becomes sick, he has committed some particular sin, but it does mean that had there been no sin in the world, there would be no sickness. Sin opened the door to physical ailment. In other words, had man not fallen, his body would not have become susceptible to a, a perversion because Satan would have had no authority. See, when, when Adam committed high treason in the garden, he opened the door for Satan's authority, and Satan began to enforce his evil plan on, on every aspect of God's creation, physically, spiritually. So when man became spiritually bound by Satan, he began to enforce his perversion of God's creation on the man's physical body. Hallelujah, glory to God that we have Jesus to redeem us. Hallelujah. Um, did they turn the air conditioner on? Was a fan on or something? It's... Were you hot sunshine? It's okay now. We can turn it back. <laughs> that was a, we can turn it back now, look. Hallelujah. We've, uh, it's, we've accomplished the task. Glory to God. Um, so sickness came in as a result of sin. Now, some sicknesses and some, uh, you know, afflictions on people are, are a direct result of sin. Uh, now, let's face it. Um, we we, we kind of covered this. I don't want to cover it in any depth, but, you know, our, our STDs are a result, uh, and, and most of the ones that are, that are manifest in the planet today are results of perversion. They, they, entered, they entered through through perverse acts and uh, became, you know, in the mainstream of the human population because of other sin. But, uh, you know, they were, they were a result of sin, perverse sin. And, um, you, know, you know, God told us not to do certain things, not because it was... He didn't want you to have fun. He was some things to kill you. Hello? All right. You know, uh, the AIDS epidemic would have been thwarted had we dealt with it. Um, what? There is a fog on the platform. Hallelujah. Okay, there's a fog on the platform and wings. <laughs> Give those a shot. Hallelujah. All right. Hey, I can use these. Are they your readers? They're Brooks's readers. Hallelujah. I'm his daddy, so it's okay. Guess we saw something in the glory tonight while we were. Uh, hallelujah. Well, it's, you know, God's, God's good. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Brooks might not get these back. We, we, I got down to the, to the funeral uh, uh, for Kathy and Karen's mom, and um, one of her brothers, I went up to him, he, he said, I said, you don't remember me? You, oh, yeah, you're Brooks's dad. <laughs> I don't look a thing like Brooks's dad. So Brooks became my son that day. <laughs> big Brooks, not little Brooks, big Brooks. Hallelujah. Um. So let's, let's look at a couple things. John 5, 14, Jesus spoke to the man at the pool of Bethesda and said, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. Even the disciples recognized this principle when they asked the man about the man who was a um, born blind master who did sin this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now, although they were wrong in this case, that was still the principle was understood and known that sin could cause sicknesses in people's bodies. You go out and engage, you, you go out and do drugs. Break your body's immune system down and you can get all kinds of diseases. You know? Engage in, in um, 
activities that are, that are, that are seedy. Reprobate. You can cause sicknesses and diseases to enter your body. Some sin, sicknesses, are direct results of certain sins. <clears throat> now, not, not every time you're sick you have one, but you know, you can. We, ha we have to look at everything. When you're, when you're believing God to be healed from something, uh, if, you're, if you're opening the door through a certain type of sin, uh, you need to repent. Yeah. In order to get healed. See, we want people to get well. Well, you can't keep engaging in perverse acts and expect God to heal you so you can go right back and get, get something again. As I say, if we had dealt with AIDS, if we had dealt with any other uh, disease like that in history, uh, it, it, we could have wiped it out. But it became a political disease. Did you know that people could be tested for AIDS? You could not tell anybody they had it if you found out. And they're, they're a walking death machine. People, people could not be notified by law that that person had AIDS. The only thing I know of that we've ever done with a disease where you, you could not notify anybody they had it when it was a danger to the population. If they had the bubonic plague, they would have been quarantined because coming in contact with the public could have, could have killed other people. Yeah. You see? So, you know, it's, it's just one of those, those, those signs of the times or whatever. But the fact of the matter is certain activities create certain diseases, and we need to be, we need to be aware of that. Um. Let's see here. And that was in John 9, too. And all that, like I said, they were wrong in this case. That principle remains. Certain sins are against the body that exposes you to diseases. Um, let's look over in Psalm 38. We'll read verses 3 through 10. Psalm 38. I know people don't like to talk about this. But we have to deal with the reality. Um, see, we're running around going to try to get people well, and, and, and uh, they're shooting up. You're going to have to get them, you're going to have to, you know, we, God will heal them, but you've got to get them off the drugs. They can't keep mainline a needle up their arm. Uh, my pastor, uh, his nickname used to be Chiquita before he got saved. Because he was so yellow from doing dirty needles. He used to shoot up and, and use dirty needles and he got, he got hepatitis from shooting up. God healed him when he got saved and quit. But he got healed. He's still alive today and doing fine. He's not yellow anymore. He's, he's normal Polak color. He's Polish. Uh, we, used, we used to give him Polak coffee mugs and stuff like that. I mean, he, he's fine with it. It's not, it's not a, uh, what's, the, what's the Polish coffee mug? It's one with a handle on the inside. <laughs> we used to go find all the Polish Polak jokes and tell him. And he, he, enjoyed, he would tell them to other people, you know. <laughs> so he's cool with it. Glory to God. Psalm uh, 38, starting verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. There is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desires before thee and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, is also gone from me. Now, what's happened? See, you notice it says here, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Something he had done, something that, you know, it was opening the door. And we need to deal with this. We're dealing with sickness and disease. Now, listen, folks, you've got you to take things in balance. You don't need to go home and go, oh, my God, what have I done? I, I'm sick. But you also need to judge yourself. And, you, and listen, here's the thing. Your heart knows. Your heart knows. If you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. That's simple. It's not real complicated. Now, we were somewhere recently, and one of the kids' relatives, one of our relatives, told uh, one, of, one of my kids, said, I know you, you know that um, you don't agree with how I live my life, you know, and so forth and so on. I said, they know. They didn't say, I don't agree with your life. Never said a word about it. And of course, Shada, being the humming gator that she is, <laughs> looks at him and says, you know, you're right, but I still love you. Yeah. I don't agree with it, but I love you. You know, but didn't he say anything? And they start, you know, have you ever noticed how people sometimes can start apologizing for stuff and you haven't even opened your mouth? Yeah. Yeah. That's because their heart convicts them. Wigglesworth got on a train one time over in, in, in England, 
And he sat down beside an Anglican priest. And they're sitting there for just a little while riding down, riding on the train. All of a sudden, the priest gets up and runs off his ho hollers. My God, man, you convict me of sin. He didn't say a word to him. Just the, just the presence of God. Well, <clears throat> so, you know, the bottom line is this. People know. You don't have to, you don't have to go and say, hey, you're in sin. They know it. They'll start apologizing for their sin. You know, I've been around people, you know, and, they, and they'll, be, they'll be drinking, and all of a sudden they find out you're a pastor or a preacher, you know, and next thing you know, well, I, look, I don't drink that much. I, every once in a while I have something. I didn't say anything. I didn't, I didn't say a word. And they're, you know, they're, they're trying to hide it and stick it somewhere and, you know, and make apology for it or, you know, uh, you know well, I don't drink that much, and, you know, and, and, and the Bible really don't say, you know, they'll start trying to quote the Bible. Now, all that to say this, man's heart knows when he's doing right and when he's doing wrong. Amen. So let me, let me say this to you. If you're dealing with sicknesses and, you're, and, and you, you've looked in your heart and there's not anything you know, screaming out, quit doing such and such, don't, don't beat yourself over the head think, trying to figure out what sin you've done you can't figure out what it is. Okay? But on the other hand, if you know there's things there and you're wanting, you need to be healed, and it's just glaring at you, repent. Do not lie down and look at the finished work of Jesus and say it doesn't matter. Right. Repent. Right. <clears throat> Ask God to forgive you. Let godly sorrow work repentance in you and cleanse you from that. Don't be a bonehead. Don't listen to people who don't know what they're talking about. They'll just keep you sick. Oh no, if I just quit, if I just lie down and look at the finished work of Jesus, I'll get healed no matter what. You can't keep shooting up and get and get and, and expect God to do things. Hello? You can't drink, keep drinking six two-liter cokes a day and expect your body to be well. Let's just forget drugs. Let's talk about stupid stuff. I mean, drinking six two-liter cokes a day, that's a lot of coke. I don't know how much how many, how many calories in one two-liter, but it's a bunch. What is it, 64 ounces, 60, 67.2 ounces, 5 ounces? And serving is normally 12 ounces. So that's five, at least five and a half servings. And a serving of Coke has about 150 calories per serving. So one two liter would have, you know, about 800 calories. Six of those is 5,000 calories a day in Coke. If you're doing that and you're wondering why you've got problems in your bones and all that kind of stuff, repent and give up the Coca-Cola. You're hurting your body. You know, and you're, you're, you know, somebody told somebody I know one time, they said, well, I only drink four Cokes a day. The rest of the other time I drink at least two, two eight-ounce glasses of water a day. I'm getting, I'm getting all my fluids. Jesus helped the foolish. Amen? Okay. And so here, you know, um, Let's look at 3110, back up in just a few chapters. It says, My life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquities. My bones are consumed. Now, let me say this. As a New Testament believer, you can repent and keep things under the blood and get things out of your life. You don't have to be hounded by past sin. Hold, uh, chasing you down, but I'm telling you that if you've got things going on in your life and you're not dealing with it, you're opening the door for things to happen to you. Foolishness will get you in trouble. You cannot be in here, like, brother, remember uh, Dad Hagen telling the story about the time he had preached, was kind of sweaty, went out in the cold without his coat on, because even Aretha said something about putting your coat on. He says, I'll be all right, went out there and got, and got a cold. Now, I'm sure she wouldn't come up to him and say, I told you so. You know, and, and the Lord rebuked him for it, you know, because he was being foolish. Yeah. You know, we were, we're going to run outside. And do, I claim immunity from everything in Jesus' name. And you're outside in shorts, barefoot, no T-shirt on, and it's 22 degrees below zero. And we know that, that, that the changes in temperatures does something to the body that makes it susceptible to things. And we need to take, you need to take care of yourself. You don't need to be foolish. Foolishness will get you in trouble. And foolishness is, is a form of sin. Because it's stupidity. Amen? And, and you know, the Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. What's foolish is, sin, is, is not a faith. 
So what I'm trying to say is this. If, you, if there's sin in your life, if there's things you like, don't, don't, don't override that and ignore it and claim, I'm going to get healed, praise God, no matter what, because God, you know, the Bible says he's my healer. Well, he is your healer. But he's also, you know, you need to deal with stuff. Um, another, another, yeah, now let's, let's come into spiritual issues. And we talked about some natural things, but that's spiritual issues. Not walking in love. And Dad Hagen said this a number of times, a number of years ago, and he said it numerous times. I heard him over the years say it. He said if he asked the Lord for something, concerning particularly uh, healing in his body or receiving something along those lines, and he doesn't get an answer, he starts checking up. And if, you know what he says? And the first place I check is my love walk. It is the, our love walk is the easiest place to get out of balance first of all the things in our life. We can get out of love. See, we need to stay in love. We can justify our actions in a heartbeat. I've had people tell me that the Lord showed them that they don't have to be the devil's doormat and stuff. No, but you're to walk in love. The Lord, you know, they talk, the Lord showed them this, the Lord showed them. I just, I, I get tired of hear, hearing people get, get exemptions. It's kind of like Obamacare. There's 40, 40 million exemptions. Listen, everybody, either, either, everybody either do it or everybody don't do it. This was got, Congress doesn't have to do it. The president doesn't have to do it. The staffers at Congress don't have to do it, but you've got to do it. You know, but they're going to give this group an extension. They're going to give this one an extension. They're not going to do this. You know, there's exemption, exemption, exemption. You know, you know there's no exemptions from the Bible. Right. God's not a politician. Right. Amen. Now, you know, on the, other, on the other issue, you know, if we're going to pass the law, let's everybody just live under the law and it's just the way it is. Let's don't make exemptions for your buddies and, you know, for this one to keep, make sure you maintain votes and keep this group happy so they'll get you reelected or get your group. If we're going to pass stuff, everybody has to live under I just think Congress ought to have to live under the laws they pass. Personally, yeah. they passed a law that I have to live under. They should have to live under it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I mean, if they if I can't break the law, uh, you know, driving down the road, they can't break the law driving down the road. Yeah. I, I just don't I think it's the way it should be. As a matter of fact, they should be held to a higher standard. Yeah. Okay. But that's not the sermon tonight. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, God, you know, somebody telling you, God, you always tell me God gave them exempt. You know, God, I taught the Lord and he showed me this. And. <clears throat> it's amazing how it's always what they want to do, and it always put, it keeps them from being put in an inconvenience. You know, you can't, you know, love, walking love is going to put you at an inconvenience every, some, every once in a while. What do you mean by put you at an inconvenience? It's going to mean you're going to have to put your flesh under. You're going to have to do the right thing whether you like doing it or not. Hello? You're going to have to do the right thing. Uh, but anyway, so Dan Hagen told the story a number of years ago, and, um, uh, this is the old story because, you know, the Monterey House has been gone for a number of years. But uh, uh, back in, in the uh, oh, earlier years of, of Raymond Bible Trade Center, uh, when they, they, Dad taught prayer and healing school. He taught it most of the time. Now, over the years, they raised up other people, and they, they, they would go over and lead and teach over there for, you know, and uh, different ones that he, he trained, and they, they went and taught over there. But he, back in those days, he taught it every, every afternoon. Uh, we, you get out of school about 11, 30, 12, depending on, uh, uh, we had an extra half hour on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then, uh, and then about 1.30, they go over and have prayer, they go over to healing school, and he'd teach on healing. And, and it was open, it was open to the public, but it was primarily designed for terminally ill people to come and get, and, and get into an environment where they could get healed and sit there for one, two, three, four, five weeks, whatever it took for them to get the word in them and get them healed. And uh, had this woman in there, and... Uh, you know, he's going to teach on healing. He just gets, gets off and starts talking about walking in love. Forgiving one another. That love will, will thwart your faith. Not walking in love will thwart your faith. So he's teaching on how, how that faith works by love. Well, she got, it, she got it right in the middle of the service and, and went outside. She had been operated on. And when they operated on, they, actually, they, they inadvertently slit her esophagus. And because of the scar tissue, she couldn't swallow solid foods. Hadn't eaten solid food in two years. Had to drink, I was on a completely liquid diet because the esophagus wouldn't, you know, because of the scar tissue, wouldn't push the food down and um, damage nerves and stuff. And um, got up and walked across the street, you know, we, this, this is before cell phones, bag phones, you know, any other kind of mobile thing. You had walkie talkies, but they don't reach, four, you know, a thousand miles. They don't reach a mile and a half. But um, across the street was the Monterey house. 
and it's a Mexican restaurant, and they had an outside payphone. She went over there and picked up the phone and called her brother up in New England somewhere. Got him on the phone and said, I, I need for you to forgive me. Now, here's the thing. In the conversation, they couldn't remember why they hadn't talked to him in 15 years. Couldn't remember why they had a fallen out. Isn't that how sin works? You fall out, you got, you got something against somebody, and then when you try to figure out what it is, they can't remember what it was that, it, that caused the fallout in the first place. Well, they got on the phone, they said, I forgive you, and they got all walking in love and, you know, and got things patched up on the phone and got healed while she was talking to them. Went in and ate two Mexican meals. Hadn't eaten, hadn't eaten solid food in two years. Now listen, you would think if you're going to eat first, first meal after two years of not eating anything solid, you at least go get some chicken noodle soup or something. You know, but she got healed. Now listen, you know, how many, you know, go a few days, you know, you know you, a lot of times you don't want Mexican food on an empty stomach. You know, I mean, I, li I like a, I like a rose con pollo. Uh, in, uh, uh, un plato de frijoles. Uh, muy bueno. Gloria a Dios. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. I mean, I can do it. Amen. Queso, chips, <laughs> hallelujah. Dip that. Mm, God, wow. Anyway, man, used to, I wouldn't even touch Mexican food, man. I love it. <laughs> praise God. Amen. Get some habichuelas, praise God, hallelujah. She ate two Mexican meals. Didn't bother her a bit. Sometimes, people, it's not a lack of faith. You're not walking in love. There's something else. See, if faith works by love, you may have all the faith in the world, but if I have love, I have nothing. And if your faith works by love, in other words, the power of faith. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But that which energizes your faith is your love walk. Now, Galatians 5, 6 says faith worketh, or the word there it means to be energized, empowered by love. Walking in love. I believe it's Galatians 5, 6. Okay. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Amen. See, you can get out of love, and you can be quoting all the scriptures, you can be believing God, I mean, until your, green, your teeth turn purple, neon purple. But if you're not walking in love, you'll hinder your ability to receive. Amen. So what's that? See, there's a sin. Not walking in love is sin. Slap, slap, slap. Not walking in love is sin. Amen. And um, see, there's a sin that'll keep you from receiving from God. You open the door. So you, and see, she just got back in love and got healed standing right there. Why? Her faith was out there, but it wasn't empowered. The minute she got back in love, the power went into it and it brought the results. Glory to God. So we need to check up on our life. Like, like I said, Dad Hagen would say, first place he'd check up is his love walk. Got out, did a get out of love somewhere. Now, why, why is this? See, you, we, got to, we have to look at all the things. Because you can go out and be rebuking the devil all day long and you're the problem. That went over big. So you get out of love, you can rebuke the devil. That's not going to fix you, your love walk. Now, on the other hand of that, well, see, we're trying to make you sure that when you go and you begin to look at some things and something's going on and you begin to go through and you know, like, well, you know, I'm praying, I believe in God, but I'm not getting results. You know, you need to look at everything. You need to look at everything. And if your love walks out of whack, get, get back in love. So that's real simple. It, look, I can tell you, it don't take long to get back in love. Why? Because the love of God constrains us, constrains us. The love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. It's there. You've chosen not to operate in it. As soon as you, as soon as you relinquish your, 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 your attitude against not walking in it and begin to walk and say, Lord, I, I love him, it, it'll rise up and flow out of you. It'll take control. Because you, you, took, you took the damper off. You took the restraints off of it. Amen. See, the love of God is trying to constrain you from doing things, and you're restraining it because you don't want to do it that way. Did you know we're going to have to learn? Paul said, I'm willing to spend to be spent for the gospel's sake. There's a lot of Christians who aren't willing to be spent for the gospel's sake. Ooh. Hallelujah. All right. Where was it? Okay, here.
We went to Psalm 31, 10, weren't we? Yeah, we read that, didn't we? All right. Find that the physicians and psychologists, uh, they, 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 um, they realize this. Anger, hatred, fear, sense of guilt are larger responsible for a lot of diseases. Ulcers, arthritis, heart trouble, a lot of things have come from a attitudes. Hatred and fear are sin. Jesus uh, condemned hatred as murder in, in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Wow. He condemned the seed of murder, not only the full-grown fruit of it. Fear is sin. What serves not a faith is sin. A guilty conscience, the, the, the result of unconfessed and unforgiven sins, is, the, is, is in many cases the cause of people's physical illnesses. Hello? Now, here's, now here's where the, the crazy psycholo psychological, they realize that, that guilt causes a lot of people to be sick. So what they try to do is they try to, to rid them of, the, of being guilty about anything. You know, uh, there's no God. The Bible's not true. You, there is no morality. It's amoral. We live in a, you know, wants to become a, an amoral society. Situational ethics. In other words, so they, what they try to do is they try to teach people not to believe anything is wrong to relieve them of the guilt. That's what that's all about. Now that's the wisdom of this world, earth essential, devilish. Or all in that. Because man's conscience bears, bears witness with him that he's an alienation to the laws of God. And that's where the guilt comes from. And so the world's trying to teach people that, that because you know, they try to say there is no God, there is no moral authority, there is no right or wrong. There's, there's some stupid college um, out in Oregon or somewhere is now allowing seven different answers to your. Uh, to your to your gender, male, female, um, homosexual, lesbian, transgender male, transgender female, um, queer gender. You don't know which one you are. Now, how could see we're living in? See, you go study secular humanism and study the philosophies of secular humanism and in, 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 in alignment with. Um, Marxist Leninism, and even when you get to cosmic humanism, then, then it's, 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 cosmic humanism is everything is God. Anything you want to be God is God. Secular humanism is man is God. There is no right or wrong. Secular humanism is recognized by the IRS as a nonprofit or CO, C, 501c3 religious organization based on the humanist manifestos one and two. So that when they teach no God in school, they're teaching secular humanism. They are establishing a state religion. Remember, because they say if we say anything about God in the classroom, by default, the Supreme Court, the Warren Court said that it became a religion because they, they, were, they were allowed to say it. By de facto, it was a state organized religion because they were allowed to speak about God in the classroom. The, the, the inability to speak about God in the classroom is a state instituted religion of secular humanism. And the IRS recognizes them as a religious organization. They get tax, the secular humanists get 5013 religious organization status, nonprofit status. And the, the, the humanists of the world try to talk people out of feeling guilty by denying the existence of God, therefore there's no moral authority, and you shouldn't feel guilty for whatever it is you're doing. But that's the way they deal with it. We deal with it. Repent! Get your conscience clean. No, you know, the, how much more shall the blood of the Lamb, yes. the spotless Lamb of God, who through the eternal spirit often set without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Yes. We deal with it with get it under the blood. Yes. You'll get your conscience cleansed. Yes. And you'll get rid of the guilt. Right. So you can get healed. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, we talked about misuse of the body. In relation to your diet and morals, if you don't take care of it, it's sin. Hello? You know Israel had dietary laws? Now, we, we, we have dietary laws. Here's, our, here's the New Testament dietary law. Do all things in moderation. There's nothing wrong with eating red meat. I know the vegans don't like that. Well, tough. I'm going to eat a cow. 
I'm not going to Chick-fil-A every day. I'm going to get the burger. Even if the cow is hounding and harassing me. <laughs> Amen? But you can't eat, you know, four pounds of red meat a day. No, you can't, you know, can you eat four pounds of chicken a day? Hello? It's, 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 you know, we need to, you know, everybody says, well, you got to get back to, you know, the old, the, the, the old Testament way of doing anything. You got to have everything organically grown. How many can get everything organically grown? So the luck is who can afford it? Free range chicken. I don't care if it's free range or cage range. When I sanctify it by faith, I just have to eat in moderation. There's nothing wrong with a Hershey bar. There is wrong with eating the whole package at one sitting with a half a gallon of milk with chocolate, Hershey syrup in it. Are you here? So we do have dietary laws. Our dietary laws let all things be done in moderation. You, you eat in moderation. You know, you can overeat well, almonds that are good for you. If you eat 10 pounds of almonds a day, that's too much. Collards are good for you. But if you eat, you know, I mean, if you eat seven pounds of collards, I'm from Aden, North Carolina, home of the official collard festival. And the collard eating champion, I think the record, they may have done it more than since then, but was six pounds in 30 minutes. And you had to keep them down for 30 minutes. I like collards. But I ain't eating six pounds of collards in 30 minutes. I probably won't eat six pounds in 30 days. Hello. <clears throat> That's excess. You know, you ever seen the, hot dog, the Nathan's hot dog eating contest? And they eat 25 or 45 or whatever hot dogs, and, you know, and, and they're, just, they're dipping them in water so the bread soaks up, and they're shoving them in. And that girl's got the jaws like this with her all crammed down in there and this kind of stuff. You don't need 35 hot dogs. You don't need 35 hot dogs in a month. We can't see. So we have dietary laws. We have moderation teaching. I know this is a little bit on the natural side, some of these things. But we just, these are some of the things we have to consider when we go before the Lord for healing. Amen. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with McDonald's. I go by McDonald's occasionally. I get a double cheeseburger, no pickle, no onions. French fries, hot. I want them hot. I will wait for you to cook them and come out of the grease hot. Eat up, ba 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 With a Coca-Cola. But you can't do it three times a day. You can't do it every single day. You're eating stuff that, you know, that, that in, in, in excess is not good for you. Yeah, occasionally, it's not going to hurt you. Now, my son said every time he rides by McDonald's, when he, when he gets kids, he's going to reach back in the back seat and just slap them. <laughs> and I said, now I'm going to go pick them up, and I'm going to bring them over and say, come with Pop Pop. <laughs> Here you go, buddy. Have some French fries. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. And we're looking forward to that day. We love babies. Amen. Okay. Look, overworking. You have to take care of your, yourself physically. Old preachers used to tell Dad, hey, and say, I'd rather uh, rust, uh, what was it? I'd rather um, wear out than rust out. You don't have to do either. You can use wisdom in how, how, much you, how you work. The body can only take so much. You can't deprive yourself of sleep for so long. Your body has to have rest. Well, he that entered into faith is entering the rest. Stupid. That's just stupid. You don't even know what you're talking about. You don't even understand the Bible when you say stuff like that. Yeah. I've worked 80 hours this week, got two hours of sleep a day. I'm still strong as ever. Keep it up long enough and we'll be burying you. Because your body has to have rest. God designed it to have rest. It needs recovery time. Jesus withdrew and prayed. But you know, Jesus also slept. Yeah. Yeah. We, have, we, have, we have Bible of Jesus sleeping on the boat. Hello? Had to wake him up in such a deep sleep. Rest is important. So you've got, you got to be, be balanced. You can't be going and 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 never getting any rest. Your mind, needs, your, your mind needs rest. Your body needs rest. Amen. And to overwork your body and not take care of the temple of the Holy Ghost is a sin. So find the balance. I can't afford to rest. Yes, you, know, you can't afford not to rest. It's just like tithing. You can't afford not to tithe. You can't, you can't afford not to rest. Amen? Hello? Glory to God. 
So, you know, don't misuse your body. Don't overwork it. Don't overeat. Amen. And listen, preachers are sometimes worse about this than anybody. Brother Hagin said, I'll still be out there preaching when you're gone. Because I'm building a ministry on the word, they, they, they just push themselves. He had one preacher say he just sits on the edge of his bed for 30 minutes in the morning before he put a sock on. You know, you know, listen, the anointing of God. God, people put a demand on the anointing and the anointing of God. I'll tell you something. Now, you, you want to know what I do Sunday afternoons? You think I go home and just sit, sit around and watch football games? I go home and rest. I used to take a super power nap on Sunday afternoons. Why? Because I've given out spiritually. My body needs to recover. Then, you know, then we come back to church on Sunday night and preach again. Body needs to recover. I just can't, you just can't go, well, we got this, do that, do that. No, I need rest. Whatever that is can wait because, you know, my body needs rest. And I'm not foolish about it. I don't sleep 17 hours at a time. You go the other way, you know. But, you know, we got, you've got to give your body yourself proper rest, proper diet, proper exercise, different things we all need to be doing, you know. <clears throat> and if we're not doing those things, let's, let's adjust them in our lives because God wants you well. But some things are not a matter of getting divinely healed. Some things are a matter of, of making adjustments in the arena of where you're not doing what you should be doing. Amen. Like Fred Price said, that woman came in and said, said I don't understand it. I'm gaining weight. What, well, what do you eat? Oh, I cast the calories out before I eat. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, you really can't. We're believing God we wouldn't get pregnant while they're having relations as a husband and wife. And believing God they wouldn't get pregnant. You can't believe God you wouldn't get pregnant. Actually, the scripture says be fruitful and multiply. It doesn't say, say have fun and don't have babies. It says be fruitful and multiply. So what happens? If you do what it takes to multiply, you're going to multiply. And going to use your, you can't use faith against the, the word of God. Hello? I'm going to, I'm going to eat, you know, I'm going to drink seven Slurpees. Now, I like going by sheets every once in a while. I like a Pepsi. I like it better than Mountain Dew. The Pepsi Freezy. I like those. Mountain Dews are good, too. Now, I don't care for the, those crazy mixtures, but, you know, the Pepsi or the Mountain Dew, man, they're just good. But I don't stop and get one every day. I don't get one every other day. I don't get one every week. Occasionally I'll get one. They're good. I like to go find them where they have the cheer wine slushies. Glory. They are good. And I did find myself one time drinking, drinking one every day. Not the little one, the big one. I get the 32 ounce. I had to stop myself. I had to say no. Yeah. No, that's wrong. I just had to stop. Because 32 ounces of cheer wine every day is not good. It, well, it wasn't good for me. It was good. In that frozen state, it was awesome. But it wasn't good for me. And I had to make an adjustment because it wasn't good for me. And so I, you know, I don't get them. I, I get them once every a month, a month or something. You know, um, just, it's, a, it's an occasional, a very occasional thing. So, you know, it doesn't mean you can't, you can't ever have in something you enjoy pleasurably and, and, and eating or whatever. But at the same time, you've got to use wisdom. And not violate certain laws under the guise that God's going to heal you no matter what you do. No, you, you're going to, if you violate certain things long enough, you'll mess things up. Can you say, help me Jesus? All right, praise the Lord. Well, we're going to stop there.